Um, all right, everyone. Uh, today is January 24th. This is the Faith and Function class. Uh, this is being recorded. It shows up on the Idlewild YouTube channel uh, later on in the week. So if you ever want to go back, you can. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Peter Gatke. He is the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean and Professor of Christian Ethics at Memphis Theological Seminary. Uh, next time I need to write that better. So it says theological instead of theology. Um, he's with us for two weeks. Um, the topic is spirituality in a time of pandemic. Are there any announcements or prayer concerns? Uh, I didn't put it in the email this time, but it's in the adult ministry email that Sarah sends out. The uh, health equity series that Rhodes College is doing, uh, it's the second and fourth Sundays, so that's today. And so the second session is agency bias and structure competence with Kendra Holtz at 4 p.m. Uh, the way it works is there's a lecture that's already been recorded that you need to watch before the Zoom discussion session or else you won't know what they're talking about. Um, so anyway, information on that is in the adult ministry uh, newsletter and on the site. Um, anything else? Uh, all right, we'll start with uh, prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to come together, uh, even though we're physically separate. We ask that you uh, speak to us this day from, from your word so that we might know how to live in these strange times. Amen. All right. We ready? Yep. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see some familiar faces. Um, you know, I miss being able to be with you all at Idlewild, and that's part of the uh, part of the topic for this morning is how do we get through these times um, of pandemic, of separation, of illness and death uh, in ways that are expressive of and embody our, our faith as uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, as members of his church um, as we go forward. So um, I started thinking about this topic uh, late last spring, uh, shortly after we had gone online at Memphis Theological Seminary um, it was the end of seminary as we know it, and our students who were in churches serving as ministers were facing all the challenges of transitioning to uh, worship online. Uh, all of us were facing the transitions of social distancing, of wearing masks, um, and I started wondering about uh, how do we go through this as people of faith? Um, how does our faith in God, our discipleship informed by Jesus Christ, our lives inspired by the Holy Spirit, how do they help us to live in and respond uh, to this pandemic? How do we live faithfully uh, in this time of, of great challenge? And of course, we've been through a lot since last spring. Um, we thought that was pretty bad then. It's, it, it's, there's a sense of fatigue right now of tiredness, uh, some days almost of despair, and then there's this glimmer of hope that is uh, there that maybe wasn't there even a couple of months ago uh, with the vaccination uh, vaccines uh, out there in the future. Some people are already starting to receive those. Um, so I'd, I've just been reflecting on this and, and hopefully what I can share this morning and next week may be of help uh, to all of us. And I hope to leave plenty of time for uh, questions and comments uh, towards the end of the morning. Uh, remind me again, we go until about 1030. Is that correct, Daniel? Uh, you can do it to about 1040. Okay. So I'll make sure I, I'd stop speaking at least by 1030. So we okay. have at least 10 minutes of of uh, conversation. Um, yeah, I, make, I make the same joke every week that it's, it's a lot shorter trip down to uh, where church is. Yes. <laughs> uh, also, if, if you have questions sort of along the way, there, there is the chat feature and you can always, you know, zip out a question there uh, as we go to slow me down. Um, so one of the places where I, I began in these reflections and begin this morning is uh, maybe an obvious point, but it's one that's important, I think, for us to consider. 
is that we're not the first people of faith to go through a time of pandemic. Um, we've, we stand actually in a community of faith that's been in uh, many pandemics uh, over the years, stretching back to biblical times, certainly in the early church, the Middle Ages, and, and even more recently in what we might call the modern world. Um, there are hundreds of references to pandemics, um, to plague uh, in the Bible. Uh, Psalm 91 talks about uh, God will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence, uh, which is another word uh, that gets used biblically. And I, I kind of like that word. It's better than pandemic, pestilence. Uh, we're in the midst of a pestilence. Uh, Jesus warned his disciples that they would uh, live through famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. And he said, all of these are the beginnings of sorrows. Uh, that's Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 to 8. And just a quick review of church history, just in the West, um, there were plagues in the early church, the Antonine Plague in 165 to 180. Um, that actually killed over 5 million people and probably so disrupted the Roman Empire um, that it was, it was a contributing factor to the fall of the Roman Empire because the empire became so in, unstable due to the, the um, number of deaths. Uh, the plague of Cyprian, uh, about 5,000 people a day were dying just in the city of Rome alone. Then, of course, there's the Black Death um, of the Middle Ages, 1346 to 1353. Uh, the death toll is estimated to be somewhere between 75 and 200 million. <coughs> that was the, uh, the famous bubonic plague. Um, and then much more recently, and, and we have experience with this, the uh, yellow fever plagues that plagued uh, major cities in the United States, Philadelphia in 1793, New Orleans, 1853, and again in other years. And of course here in Memphis, 1855, 1867, and 1873, with that last one being uh, the worst when the plague, when the plague really started winding up uh, in the summer of 1873. And, and really until it sort of started to end, there are upwards of 200 people uh, dying each day from the yellow fever. About 70% uh, of the people who contracted the fever died. Um, and it really was it pretty much wiped out the city. Um, city came to an end there for a while uh, due to the plague. And then, of course, we've heard a lot lately about the Spanish flu in 1918, up to 25 million deaths in the first 25 weeks alone. Um, so all of this is a, not to undercut or to minimize what we're experiencing, but, it, but rather to say is that we, we stand on the shoulders of the ans our ancestors in the faith as we think about these, um, our own experience, and we may be able to go back and see that what, what they lived through uh, may provide some kind of resource for us. So as I've been reflecting on that, I dove into church history, uh, theology, and biblical resources, and uh, I like alliteration. So I've come up with uh, three, or excuse me, four G words uh, that will guide um, our or my reflection of spirituality in a time of pandemic. Um, and I, I don't want you to think of these as stages, but they're rather sort of touch points that we continually can return to uh, as we're praying our way and thinking our way through uh, our experiences in this time of pandemic. So the four that I'm going to talk about um, over these two weeks, um, do two today and then two next Sunday. Uh, we'll begin today with grieving, uh, and we'll end today with gratitude, and then next week we'll talk about graciousness and going forth.
So grieving, gratitude, graciousness, and going forth. And I, I've kind of kid with myself about that's a 4G network. And the 5G network is we, uh, God grounds all four of those. So our 5G network is God, grieving, gratitude, graciousness, and going forth. So why grieve? Um, what I want to try to emphasize is that it's good to grieve. It's important to grieve. Uh, that grieving uh, can be intertwined and will be intertwined with our lives of faith and that we can actually learn a lot and grow, uh, develop, deepen our spirituality, our life of faith uh, by honestly facing uh, what we are grieving. There's a great story um, in 2 Samuel chapter 21 about grieving, and it's the story of Rizpah. Uh, some of you may remember that story. It's a, it's a very, one of those strange Bible stories where kind of read it and then you shake your head and think, what was that about? So there was a great famine in the land and the Gibeonites came to King Saul and demanded that some kind of sacrifice be made to appease the gods uh, in the hope that the famine would end. And the Gibeonites had some kind of power over Saul. So he handed over five young men to the Gibeonites and they strung them up uh, outside the city as a kind of offering to God. Um, and they were the sons of Rizpah, who was a concubine of Saul. And Rizpah went out to where they had been executed uh, and guarded them through the night and the day uh, for months to come until finally there was the appropriate burial of these five men who had been killed. It's a strange story because then the famine ends and you wonder like, did they see a connection somehow between human sacrifice uh, and the end of this famine? Uh, there's really no commentary in the Bible about this, except that that's the, the faithful witness of Rizpah uh, to this, these deaths. And that's where uh, a modern, a contemporary writer by the name of Joyce Holliday looks at that story and says, uh, maybe what we need to do is learn something from Rizpah. Are we willing to cry out like she did uh, and cry for compassionate change? Are we devoted enough to act and pray until justice rolls down like raindrops from the sky on our famine part souls? And she tries to argue that we shouldn't think of this pandemic as our enemy so much as to think of it as a messenger. And personally, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with that. I, th I find that I'm, I'm not real good friends with this pandemic. Um, it's kind of is my enemy still. But even our enemies can be our message, can be messengers. And so part of what we can do in our grief is to listen um, and see what we may learn about ourselves and about our society uh, from the grief that we're experiencing. So one of the things I think that sometimes is helpful and I urge you to do this in the chat feature um, is just to name what you have come to grieve uh, in this time of pandemic since last March until now um, who and what are you grieving to just name our griefs? Um, part of the importance of naming our griefs together is that we recognize that we're in a community of, of grief, that we're not isolated in our grief. Um, we're not alone. We're part really of a, a church of grief, a community of grief. And much has happened since last March um, to grieve. Some of it's pandemic related and some of it's not. Um, and that's part of the, even anything I'm saying today about spirituality in a time of pandemic is really spirituality in a time of grief and loss. So let's take just a few minutes, a few little while, and if you can use your chat feature uh, and name, if you wish, uh, 
what you are grieving right now. And as those come up, I'll, I'll keep uh, going to refer to some of those as we go um, and honor our grief, the grief that we're sharing. Um, I grieve because I can't hug my mother. I can't go to church. Yes, deep grief. And so it's important that we be honest about our grief and not hide it. Uh, because grieving points to what's important in our lives, um, who and what we love. There's a line from a person by the name of Earl Grohlman, a book called Living with Less. It says, grief is love, not wanting to let go. Joan Chittister writes, grief is a sign that we loved something more than ourselves. Grief makes us worthy to suffer with the rest of the world. I, I like Anne Lamont quite a bit. Um, she writes, grief is like a lazy Susan. One day it is heavy and underwater, and the next day it spins and stops at loud and rageful, and the next day at wounded keening, and the next day numbness silence. People are naming their griefs. Sometimes we have a hard time naming griefs because we think maybe that if we're grieving, we're not being faithful. Somehow um, indicates a lack of faith as if somehow faith was supposed to inoculate us from grief, which I'm hoping to, I'm urging this morning that in fact, grieving is a deep act of faith. What the Bible shows to us is that grieving is really essential in our faith. There are is lots of grieving uh, in the Bible. There's a whole book of grieving called Lamentation. Uh, there's this great song uh, that comes out of the book of Lamentations. Um, it's a song that's called Great Is Your Faithfulness. Uh, how many people know that song? Probably quite a few. A few hands went up. Um, comes out of Lamentations chapter 3, verses 17 to 26. I'm going to read that as we grieve. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For God's compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The book of Lamentations is filled with such depth of grieving. And in the midst of that grieving is this deep compassion for others and this deep faithfulness to God. Job, of course, is another book of the Bible that's devoted to grieving, to lamentation. As Job says in uh, chapter 3, verse 11, why did I not perish at birth, come forth from the womb, and expire? David laments over Saul and Jonathan. David laments over Abner. The prophets lament. Jeremiah 15, 18, why is my pain continuous, my wound incurable? 
uh, in Ezekiel, there's lots of lamentation. Ezekiel 32, 2, you are like a lion among the nations. You are like a monster in the seas, thrashing about in your streams, churning the water with your feet and muddying the streams. Sounds like the kind of the chaos that we can sort of live into uh, as we grieve. About a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lamentation. Uh, Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. And how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? So the, what the Bible points to is something that I'd said a little earlier that we can learn and have our faith deepened in the midst of grief. That in fact, spiritual wisdom emerges from grief. Ecclesiastes says in 7, 2 and 4, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting because death is the end of all humankind. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. And I love the question that just came forward in the chat. If the pandemic is a messenger, what's the message? And just let that one sit for a while. We can all think about what have we been learning? What have we been hearing in our hearts uh, in the midst of this pandemic? Um, one of the things I'd say what, for me, uh, as I've wrestled with this, um, I've really seen that one of the messages that may come through the pandemic is that I've become more aware of the what's troubled in our land uh, and what's troubling in my own heart. Um, we can think of a pandemic as a revelation. It's apocalyptic uh, in the traditional sense of that word, apocalypsis, the Greek word, which means to reveal or to unveil. And one of the things that's unveiled in a pandemic is that none of us survive alone. Um, we thrive and we live uh, through the care and compassion that others may extend to us. Uh, and the converse of that is we die if we don't care for each other. Um, I think the, the, the what we've been asked to do in terms of the public health measures, uh, if we do those together, we work together, wearing a mask, social distancing, being cautious and careful about how we interact with each other, um, that actually can result in health, in well-being. The more we sort of try to push forward by ourselves and say, no, I'm not going to care about others. I'm not going to wear a mask. I'm not going to do social distancing. I'm just going to live my life the way I want to live it. Uh, the more the virus uh, spreads and the more death there is. And so one of, the, one of the messages is that we go up together or we go down together. Uh, our social connectivity, uh, the way in which we are created by God for each other is confirmed in the pandemic. Um, I think there's another message that comes through to us and, and that is that grief may be a way in which God actually speaks through us in our desire for a better world. Um, came across Romans chapter eight, verses 26 to 27. It's this great uh, teaching from Paul about prayer. In the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And God, who searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. That this desire uh, for a different world, for healing, for hope, for justice, it's deeply rooted in the reality, the presence of God in our lives. 
we wouldn't know how to protest uh, against what is unless we had a sense that there must be something different. Um, we, we move from kind of what is to, and we, we're grounded in a vision of what ought to be. And that vision of what ought to be is at the very heart of the reality of God. We might see some of this in the life of Jesus. Um, in Isaiah 53, 3, uh, this has been appropriated with, within our faith as Christians that we see Isaiah is describing uh, the Son of God, describing Jesus as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, 3, that Jesus was a man of sorrows and one well acquainted with grief. Um, so I, I've been reflecting on how does Jesus grieve or what does Jesus grieve for? And how might he be an example for us and a teacher for us in the midst of grief? One of the things is in the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Um, again, that we don't run away from mourning. We embrace it as part of uh, growing in closeness to God and to each other that in our mourning, we learn compassion. And perhaps that's another message that comes out of um, this time of pandemic is that we, we all need to learn a deeper form of compassion, of a willingness to be with each other in this time of suffering. Um, maybe it's in weeping uh, like Jesus did that we are blessed. Um, what does Jesus weep over? There's in Mark chapter three, um, Jesus grieves at the hardness of the heart of religious leaders who would not answer this question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? And again, one of the messages might be that we have to re-examine our, our communities of faith and our lives of faith and ask ourselves, are we primarily communities of compassion um, who see that it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Or are we primarily um, communities of control who are much more concerned about telling people what they ought not to do um, and offering judgment? Jesus also grieves at the death of his friends uh, in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus learns of the death of John the Baptist. And we're told that when he heard the news about the beheading of John, he got on a boat and he went out and went to a desolate place to grieve. Uh, Jesus wept for his friend Lazarus, who died. Uh, that's in John chapter 11. Jesus wept over our shared social failure to do right when he wept over Jerusalem in Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. I thought of this on uh, Dr. the Dr. King holiday and then the uh, events at the Capitol just a few days uh, prior to that holiday and how those are kind of bookends of what goes on uh, in our society. Jesus' sorrow over his own death, Matthew 26, 38, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. And of course, we know that his disciples couldn't bear that grief. And they did something that we sometimes do when we're exhausted by grief, we just sleep, uh, sleep as a kind of escape from grief. Jesus on the cross prays from Psalm 22, uh, Father, why have you forsaken me? It's one of the great lamentation Psalms uh, of the Old Testament of the Hebrew scriptures. So what, what do we learn from the grieving of Jesus? Uh, first of all, that Jesus 
teaches us to attend to our mortality and to our vulnerability as mortal creatures. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most existential questions for us in our lives as we face uh, loss in our own lives, as we grieve the loss of others in our lives. Um, what's revealed to us is something that sometimes the, the rush of the ordinary times can, can gloss over, and that is that we're vulnerable, um, that our lives are lived in the midst of loss. Um, as Jimmy, uh, Jim Morrison uh, of the Doors said, no one gets out of here alive. Uh, and there's some profound wisdom in that. And how do we respond to that reality in our lives? Does it lead us to despair uh, or does it lead us to hope? Does it lead us to trying to avoid at all costs sorrow and death? Sort of lives trying to live by control over that somehow? Or does it lead us to lives of compassion? And I see this as a, just a struggle in my own life as uh, part of this comes with aging. Uh, as we age, we, we are much more aware of, of how we are living with loss. Um, my mother right now is her sole surviving sibling, uh, her older brother, two years older than her, um, is in the last stages of pancreatic cancer. And when he goes, she'll be the only surviving sibling of a family of, of six children. So she will have lost all of her siblings. She's already, of course, lost her parents, uh, the loss of friends all along the way. And then the losses that she's experienced in her own life of uh, loss of mobility. Um, she has Parkinson's um, and the, the, just the, the loss of being able to be with people because she can't move around as freely as she used to be able to do. Um, how do we live in, th in that and through that uh, as we all age, as we all face the losses uh, in our lives? Um, does it harden us? Does it harden our hearts or does it soften us? Um, I know one of the things I've been experiencing as I age is that I, I seem to be able to cry much more easily than I used to. Um, and, and I thought, God, it must be something that comes with age because I used to be a good Minnesotan and not cry about anything. And now I'll just be watching uh, a movie with my daughter and I'll start crying. Um, I don't know what's happened to me, but it's a good thing. I like it. Uh, but it seems to be part of the wisdom that comes with age, I guess, and the, the kind of the uh, holding on to or embracing the bitter sweetness of life. Um, and that's a, that's a lesson that we can learn uh, in any grieving, but certainly it's, it's something we may learn in the midst of pandemic as well. Um, how, do we, how do we be good stewards of our grief? Uh, of the suffering that we've had in our lives. Uh, Frederick Buchner, in a book that is called The Clown in the Belfry, which I just love that title, uh, says that being a good steward of your pain involves being alive to your life. It involves taking the risk of being open, of reaching out, of keeping in touch with the pain, as well as the joy of what happens because at no time more than at a painful time do we live out of the depths of who we are instead of out of the shallows. Um, there's, there's a depth to our lives that comes in suffering and it, it, I wish there was a different way for depth, uh, but this seems to be the way in which we uh, come to depth. It might be uh, that the book of Revelation helps here, um, that our grief helps us to see where we are headed. Um, this is what Revelation 21, three to four says, see the home of God is among mortals. <coughs> God will dwell with them. They will be God's people. 
and God will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. That's what a deep desire uh, that comes out of our mourning and our grief is for a world in which our tears are wiped away. Um, this, is, this is at the heart of our faith. Um, so that's where we're headed with grief. We learn to live with our grief. Uh, we learn to find in our grief um, the ability to be compassionate. Sometimes we find in our grief even a sense of humor. <coughs> I'll tell a, a famous family story uh, from my uncle Joe, um, who this is probably 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, it's close to 50 years ago. Uh, my grandmother, his mother, had died. And that was, it was a family in which um, they rarely showed emotion. And the, they just finished the graveside service. And my Uncle Joe had gone to his car by himself, and he was in his car just weeping. Um, and this is a man who, again, you know, I just didn't see much emotion from him. So much so that well, one of his sons, uh, his oldest son, Jay, my cousin, came to the car and he came into the car and sat down and saw his father weeping. He'd never seen his dad cry over anything, much just uh, uncontrollably sobbing. And Jay didn't know how to respond. Uh, so he started to whistle, <laughs> sort of nervousness. Uh, and of course, Joe, my, my uncle heard that and looked up and just started laughing. Um, and I think that just a great, for us and our family, it's been a great story of, uh, of allowing us to grieve and also allowing us to laugh uh, in the midst of what happens as, as we are grieving. So I am glad to see from uh, the chat um, people who are touching their grief, who letting their grief out. And I'm, and I'm also happy to see from Jim and Claire that Minnesota, Minnesota folks cry plenty, you betcha. <laughs> Somebody who's obviously uh, got Minnesota roots or connections. Um, so let me talk about gratitude and then we'll have some time for uh, discussion. Um, here's something that I'm gonna ask you on chat again to contribute. Um, in the midst of our grieving, uh, what have we experienced or for what are we experiencing gratitude because of what we've experienced in the pandemic? What are we grateful for? What are we experiencing gratitude for in these times? You might start sharing that on chat. It's one of the things that grieving and loss uh, can help us to see is also make us or to help us be more aware of uh, what we're grateful for, what we give thanks for. Some people are thinking about what they have, what they want to give gratitude for. This is where the, the, the second uh, part of blessed are those who mourn. Jesus says, for they shall be comforted. People are sharing what they're in gratitude for now. Comforted is a, uh, of course, our English word is a translation from the Greek, uh, panikalin. And that word means not only to be comforted, but to also find an ally or a helper. It can also mean to be encouraged. People are sharing their gratitudes. Grateful to be in a retirement community where I can be with others in a safe way, more time to read, 
technology like we have this morning allows us to be together at least virtually. Relationships, we've had more time to nourish uh, and maintain. I want to suggest that, that gratitude is possible when we invite God into our grief. As we attend to the gifts that remain uh, in our lives, take us back to the book of Lamentation uh, of great is your faithfulness. Gratitude means we're, uh, is, it's an issue of where do we put our energies in our lives? Um, where do we put our attention? Uh, grief comes to us whether we want to pay attention to it or not sometimes. Gratitude sometimes requires a little more intentionality. Um, I, I like uh, pithy sayings that sometimes help us to think about how gratitude and grief go together. Uh, we can complain because rose, rose bushes have thorns, or we can rejoice because thorns have roses. It's a funny thing about life. Once you begin to take note of the things you are grateful for, you begin to lose sight of the things that you lack. Let gratitude, Maya Angelou says, let gratitude be the pillow upon which you kneel to say your nightly prayer. There's this uh, guy named William Shakespeare who said, O oh Lord that lends me life, Lend me a heart replete with thankfulness. It's in gratitude that we recognize the reality of God's economy, that there's more than enough for all of us if we are willing to share. Uh, the, the great stories in Matthew and Luke's gospel of the feeding of the 5,000 and the 8,000 Jesus asks the people, he orders the people to sit down on the grass, takes the five loaves and the two fish, looks up toward heaven. He blessed the food and breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. The disciples, as you might recall, were afraid because of scarcity, the apparent scarcity, and they wanted to send everybody away. And Jesus recognizes <coughs> that there's more than enough if we share. And that's a, that's a lesson that we, we keep having to uh, struggle with in our lives. We are always fearful that there's not enough. Um, we've even organized a whole economy around the principle of scarcity. Jesus's prayer of gratitude is reflected through the whole Bible. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, there are lots of thanksgiving psalms. Um, so what I'm going to wrap up here and give us some time for some questions. Um, that gratitude comes out of uh, being honest about our grief and that we, as we can hold these two together, uh, we can deepen our lives. Our lives will be deepened in our relationship with God and each, and each other. We know that scarcity is possible. Uh, we've experienced scarcity, we've experienced grief, but we also know that God's economy is possible too if we give thanks and we share. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to stop uh, with my organized, semi-organized reflections uh, and invite uh, additional questions uh, or comments. Um, and I don't know, Daniel, if you want to try to do that through uh, recognizing people and unmuting them, or if we want to continue with the chat feature, either way is fine by me. We can do either way. Uh, if you can either unmute yourselves, that's probably the simplest way. If okay. uh, if you can't, then you can wave. But if you don't have video, uh, we, I won't see you. 
Um, Partly, I invite just responses. Has this been helpful? Um, I think it's a lot of BS. You <laughs> um, think now, oh, geez, yeah, I'm really good at grieving, but that gratitude part, I'm not there yet. Or uh, maybe the gratitude, we're, it's too soon for gratitude. I don't know. But like I said, these are not steps. These are it's possible to be doing grieving and gratitude at almost the same time. Well, Pete, first I want to thank you for, for this. Um, I guess I'm <clears throat> gratitude for community because I'm finding grieving alone to be extremely difficult, if not impossible. And uh, that's been something I think all of us have dealt with over the past year. Is that <clears throat> that sense of loneliness and grieving? You know, one of the things I'm well aware of with this particular community is the raw grief. It's still raw for me, and I'm sure it is for you, of the loss of Steve Montgomery in, in the midst of a pandemic and just the deep hurt uh, of that loss. I just and came to me again and just in a kind of intense way, I was driving down Union and I saw, you know, the sign for Steve Montgomery Avenue. Uh, oh, just made my heart hurt uh, all over again. And, um, you know, just, that's part of that, that lazy Susan of grief. It just came around. Um, uh, of of tears of of weeping again and not being able to come together as a community in the midst of that is very hard Pete uh, Ted Beeler here yes you know speaking of grief of course we've grieved during this pandemic and have suffered with uh, isolation uh, mainly, our, we, we're being cautious, self-imposed. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of that grief, where I find gratitude uh, for such things as Zoom, which brings the community together, mm -hmm. uh, the ingenuity of mankind uh, in being able to push frontiers of technology, so forth, uh, and understanding of the word, has come through in the last year. The vaccine. The, the vaccine, as my wife just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, the ability, the God-given abilities that we have, the talents that we have, have come forth uh, in ways that were really unexpected, and in, uh, in in some ways have created a new community, which will lead us into the future. So both uh, with grief for what we're experiencing. Uh, and on a number of fronts, but also gratitude for God's gift to us of talent that uh, we can adjust, uh, we can move forward. And that's what I'm thankful for. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I will say that the, one of the ways that uh, Steve's death has affected me is I'm so much more careful in my driving. If I see a biker, if I cross over the green line, I slow down. Um, it, that's honoring him, I guess, mm -hmm. that, that we're careful as to who's out there. Thank you. And as a cyclist, I thank you. It's, as a society, with what we know and what we could have done, we haven't done as well in this pandemic as I think most of us think we ought to have but at the same time you know you you've talked about some of the pestilences of the past and i just think you know if this if this same disease had come along 30 years ago we didn't have the vaccine technology then we don't you know video conferencing is new is new now you know we wouldn't have that five years ago or at least it wouldn't have worked you know it uh, it would have been so much worse than it already has been and that 
it's it's that same combination of it it's it's terrible enough on its own uh but we're we're better equipped than we could have been um and so yeah and you know, i wanted to say <clears throat> excuse me this is carl Lawson. Mm -hmm. i wanted to say that um uh, i've been grieving about the earth uh, long before the pandemic came and I'm afraid that the pandemic has has has, has done more damage to uh, the possibility of our Earth recovering because it has taken, uh, you know, first page, and um, we still have the problem. Uh, I was the one that asked the question: What was the message that the messenger was sending? Mm -hmm. And I've been receiving messages. Uh, every time that I see one of these uh, uh, type five hurricanes approach the mainland, mm -hmm. um, floods and all the other signs that um, God is telling us, either the earth is too crowded or it's going too fast and I'm just gonna slow things down. That's why I am grateful for the fact that things have slowed down because it has made me really uh, it's created time for me to think and to reflect, to read, and to reach out and develop uh, even closer uh, friendships than uh, the ones that I felt like I had before. I've noticed that I'm able to talk about things that are much more, um, much deeper for me uh, with friends that I, I couldn't, I couldn't really bring those subjects up before the pandemic but somehow the pandemic has allowed me and the people that i know to uh, reach deeper and have much more meaningful conversation i've noticed the relationship uh, between my wife and i uh, being together as much as we are and this is a real blessing before the pandemic she's you know going off to committee meetings and saving the world and we didn't see each other as much, but we see each other a lot more now. And we really, really enjoy each other's company. And I'm not saying that I haven't before, but it's just in a different way now. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. I, you know, one of the things that I've experienced is something along the same lines. Um, bef before the pandemic, I'd say my life was quite frantic. And um, it was too fast. And uh, maybe it was not just my life, but as a as a society, we were living in the fast lane. And one of the pan one of the things the pandemic has done in my life is it's pushed me out of that fast lane into a much slower lane. Uh, and I'm quite grateful for that. Um, and on the days that I have hope, my hope is that we won't return to normal uh, because normal was frantic and frenzied and we need to find a different path that is slower and more human um, for us, I think as individuals, but for us as a society as well. And sometimes that's what, what grief can teach us um, is that we need to live in a different way. Uh, we can't, we should not go back to the same old, same old. Uh, we need to find a different future uh, in which we can have time for friendships, uh, time for taking walks uh, or just sitting in the backyard and listening to the birds and the airplanes going overhead too. Um, that this, this is, one of the good things about grief is that it does slow us down um, and it kind of, it disrupts ordinary time. Um, and in that disruption is where I think this space for gratitude uh, and, and a different kind of goodness can come in. If, if we let it, you know, if we let ourselves live into that vulnerability. Pete, 
<clears throat> this is Jim Lavernier. Yes. <clears throat> um, I want to thank you for bringing up God's economy. It's going to be something I'm going to think about. You said a lot of great things for us, and we really appreciate, I really appreciate uh, your being here this morning. The things you said have been meaningful, but I'm going to really think about this God's economy. I think I, I, I think maybe that's something that we could come out on a better side. Yeah, that would be really helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, so let me uh, give credit where credit is due. That phrase, God's economy, and, and sometimes called Sabbath economics, I've learned that from a biblical scholar by the name of Ched Myers, uh, M-Y-E-R-S, um, from the Bartimaeus uh, it's not community. I think it might be Bartimaeus community. There, uh, Chad. Chad is a longtime biblical scholar. He's a uh, he's from California, so he's kind of a surfer dude too. Um, he he taught at MTS for one year, but I I knew him through kind of Catholic worker circles, um, and he's he's got some really good stuff on God's economy, Sabbath economics. And it really is that at the heart of God's economy is that God created a world in which there was more than enough for everybody if we share. But if we hoard, uh, there's not enough for everybody. And, and that everybody includes the earth itself, uh, the creation as a whole. Uh, when we hoard, we, we tend to destroy the creation as well. And so how do we, how do we create an economy in which uh, sharing is, is more structured than um, hoarding. It's, it's not easy, but that's a, it's, it's worth exploring for sure. It's, I'll, I'll tell you a, uh, a story of God's economy from, this is part of family lore. Um, I grew up in a family with, there are six of us kids, and uh, at the dinner table, the way in which food was distributed as we sat around the table is that the serving platters would, cut, would start with my youngest brother, uh, and then it would go around the table around all of us and end at my dad. And uh, I'll never forget the night, I guess we had gotten older and my mom hadn't quite adjusted yet in terms of the amount of food that she was preparing. The main serving platter got around to my dad and there was nothing left. <laughs> you know, and he'd work, he's a blue collar worker. He's pretty hungry after a hard day of work. I'll never forget that look on his face when the platter arrived at him like, well, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and my mom, who I think had a better sense of Sabbath economics said, pass it back around and everybody has to put a little bit back on the platter. <laughs> and so that's what happened. <laughs> the platter went around and we all had to put a little bit back on and then it got to my dad and there was enough for him. Uh, and there was enough for the rest of us too. And some of us had been hoarding. Because uh, one of the things we learned as kids was uh, don't rely on seconds. Take as much as you can at first. <laughs> there might not be anything left. <laughs> That's the, you know, the opposite of Sabbath economics. <laughs> I'll bet you said the prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, him who eats the fastest gets the most. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> It, well, it looks like we've wrapped up just about on time. So that's amazing. It's, it's uncanny. We're right at 1040. So very good. Well, I look forward to being with you all uh, next week. We'll do another two G's um, and again, have some time for discussion. And, and you should feel free too. that uh, sometimes questions come up um, after we get off Zoom write them down and bring them back uh, next Sunday and we can address anything else that might have come up during the week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to be with you all. Bye-bye.
Bye, everybody.